Good afternoon, and welcome to the third in a relatively new series of Symposia on Health Equity. My name is John Hunter. I'm a general surgeon and the CEO of OHSU Health. It is my pleasure to introduce Good our speaker afternoon. today, Dr. Esther Chu. First, I'd like to reflect on the origins and purposes of this series. The COVID-19 pandemic has put a spotlight on health disparities in our society. BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. This is but one example of persistent systemic inequities caused by institutional racism. They exist in health, education, wealth, and the criminal justice system. As the state's academic health center, OHSU has a duty and a responsibility to address the underlying causes of adverse health outcomes. This is a core element of OHSU's commitment to being an anti-racist and multicultural institution. As President Jacobs has said, silence and inaction have led our society to where we are today and can no longer be tolerated going forward. One expression of our commitment to advance health equity will be to develop a shared vision with input from community groups and work to create new programs to address community described gaps. To be clear, we don't have the resources today to create new programs, but we believe there is an opportunity to demonstrate to OHSU's donor community how philanthropic investment will increase OHSU's capacity to improve health equity in Oregon. We believe this is a new approach for OHSU historically listening to the community first, then building solutions together. And we're anxious to get started. In the meantime, we know that there are a huge number of efforts happening across OHSU and the health equity space, many of which were developed organically through the passion and commitment of a single faculty or staff member. All of those efforts deserve to be recognized and amplified. And this symposium series is one way that we will strive to do that. And that brings me to today's speaker, Dr. Esther Chu. In one sense, Dr. Chu needs no introduction. She has attracted a large following on social media for speaking the plain and powerful truth about racism and sexism in healthcare. Dr. Chu received her MD from Yale in 2001. She completed her emergency medicine residency at Boston Medical Center in 2005 and her fellowship from HSU in 2009. Dr. Chu joined the Department of Emergency Medicine at OHSU in 2016 as full-time faculty. Her research interests include substance use disorders, violence, women's health, health disparities, gender medicine, digital health, intervention development, and faculty development. So these are our academic credentials, but I'm particularly excited today to hear about her personal journey to becoming a voice for health equity. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Esther Chu. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Um, and thanks to everyone who's on for joining me during your lunch hour. I um, wanted to just draw your attention to this email address on the slide, uh, events at ohsu.edu. Uh, we've uh, received a number of questions beforehand, uh, but I also um, uh, anticipate there will be some other questions and you can send them to that email. Uh, and I will do my best actually to reserve uh, most of the second half of this session for those questions because I have a feeling they'll be more interesting than anything that I have to say to begin with. We can advance the slide. I uh, do have two conflicts of interest to mention. Uh, I'm co-founder of a company called Equity Quotient which obtains metrics of uh, healthcare organization culture, um, particularly with respect to equity. Um, and I'm also on the board of a new company called Times Forward, which is a consulting group uh, for organizations of all kinds struggling uh, with inequity within their organization. You can move on to the next slide. I, uh, I'm going to talk about a number of uh, different things. I think this uh, this talk was designed to be kind of broad rather than deep. Um, and, and I thought I would kind of tie it all together with my very first notion of what it meant to be an advocate in healthcare. Um, you can click through these. Um, there should be three things that come up. Yeah. So um, these are all uh, journal 
uh, articles about a problem that was really endemic in healthcare uh, back in the 1980s, and it was called um, uh, patient dumping um, was the was the term for it, the colloquial term for it. And what it was was this practice of uh, of transferring patients, regardless of whether they were stable or not, um, to uh, county hospitals um, if they showed up, no matter where they showed up. So they would show up to a private hospital um, and they would take a look at them and say, this patient looks like they belong to a county hospital and they would just not even care for the patient or stabilize them and transfer them. Um, and uh, and this practice went on for a number of years, uh, and and it was routine, <laughs> and, uh, and and nobody really questioned it. Um, but a, a number of emergency medicine physicians working at the receiving hospitals found it profoundly disturbing, um, and recognized it for what it was, um, which was uh, which was a clear racism and discrimination of patients based on their income level and their insurance status. And so, you know, the 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 um, the healthcare workers who saw this problem uh, wanted to do something about it. And so they started by studying it uh, and published a number of highly influential studies in major academic medical centers. One of them uh, that was much talked about was out of Cook County. And what they documented was that out of 467 patients that were transferred from outside hospitals to Cook County, 89% of them were Black or Hispanic, 81% of them were unemployed, 87% were explicitly transferred because they lacked insurance. Only 6% of patients had documented consent for the transfer, um, and they were inappropriate transfers. 24% of them were unstable on arrival, 22% required an ICU stay, 9% of them died compared to a base rate of about 4% of patients who were not transferred. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And so um, what did we do about it? So the first thing that um, that these advocates did was they connected to media. Um, and at that point, um, there was no social media. And so they went to the mostly the print media. And there were a series of uh, newspaper articles that were much read and talked about and, and basically became a scandal for the hospitals that were doing this. And it wasn't just in Chicago, it was all around the country. People were suddenly aware of this issue of patient dumping. Um, I could click one more. Continue clicking through. So this was a national news story. Um, also showed up on the t on the t uh, on TV as well. And go to the next slide. Um, and um, and it became a question of changing policy around this. And so healthcare workers um, at these receiving hospitals actually testified in front of uh, Congress. And there was a little bit of showmanship around it. Um, they, um, a, a hospital, Grady Hospital, actually collected the wristbands of all these patients who had been transferred to them inappropriately, and they brought they they collected them over years. And as they were providing testimony, the team brought in boxes and boxes full of hundreds of these wrist ID bands from pri private hospitals that the patients were still wearing when they presented to this hospital. Um, and they emptied the boxes on a, a table in front of the hearing room. Um, and the way the narrative grows is that Entala was passed after that after that testimony. And you can go to the next slide. Entala, of course, is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which is a federal law that requires anyone coming to an ED to be stabilized and treated regardless of their insurance status or ability to pay. You can go to the next slide. Um, and so that is one example of advocacy. Um, and if you have any training in advocacy, you'll recognize that the way that um, those within the system who wanted to change it, um, it went about making that change was kind of advocacy 101. Um, but there's a couple of things that when I was a junior resident and I first heard the story and understood what Mtala was about, um, things that I, I kind of walked away with and always carried with me. And I think that was kind of the seed of my interest in being an advocate someday for things. Um, and so one thing I'll point out is the practice was implemented very easily. So people were transferring patients like this without stabilizing them. Um, Based on uh, based on their insurance status and and their and their race and ethnicity, um, without question, um, it was the easiest thing to do. In fact, it was it was routine. Um, there was no permission you needed to do this. There was no policy, um, and and we did it easily without thought, and people didn't even notice. But changing it, fixing that practice was so hard. It was literally an act of Congress to change it. And I think that is such a good example of how so much of our structural racism happens in healthcare. The, the practice, the structure is implemented easily, almost without thought. And yet when we go to try to dismantle it, it requires 
a figurative act of Congress. And I think that was something that has always struck me that seems to be universally true that needs to change. The other thing is that advocacy opportunities like this are in front of us every single day. And it's just a question of, uh, of whether it hooks us and whether we let it hook us. I have spoken to so many colleagues who practiced at a time when patient dumping was so common. And people had one of two things to say about it. Either they say, um, well, one of three things I'll say. Um, either they'll say, you know, I just didn't think about it because that's just what we did. That was the way the hospital ran. I was taught it, I did it, it was thoughtless. Um, it, or people will say, I knew it was wrong and I didn't do anything and I will always regret that. And then a smaller group of people say, I knew it was wrong, I felt sick about it, and I couldn't not feel sick until I did something about it. And those became the advocates that came together and actually um, built the science, created the data, and made um, the, the idea that there should be a specific legislative ask and then worked to go get that fulfilled. Um, the other thing I'll say is that while there was a satisfying outcome in one way in that we had a legislative change that that didn't allow organizations or individuals to do that practice anymore that unsafe transfer and, and inequitable transfer of patients i will say there was a fundamental problem reflected in the fact that organizations did this to begin with um and i always wondered what is wrong with those organizations that did it what is the culture that allowed that to happen to begin with, how were the goals and the objectives and the mission and the values of those organizations stated so that that could even happen to begin with? Um, because to me, this isn't just a how. well. And I think to me, there was a diagnosis that should have been made about organizations. They were fundamentally ill. They were not well. And I think sometimes we don't uh, take observations to that final conclusion. We look at actions and we look at events that don't make us feel comfortable. Um, we address uh, individual small uh, uh, instances of racism, of structural racism, but we don't always take it down to the ultimate fundamental diagnosis, which is that there is something about our organizations um, that allows these things to happen uh, across the broad spectrum of things that we do, and we don't often uh, address that fundamental issue. Um, and that has a lot to do with the choices that I've made in my career. So um, keep that case in mind because I think we'll come back to it. But I'm going to move on to um, to something else I was asked to talk about. Um, and that is just explaining who I am. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So um, when we were planning this talk, um, I think someone said, I think people generally know um, who it is you are, but they don't really know what it is you do or something like that. And I was like, okay, I think I can explain it. Um, and then I found that to be actually a really challenging job, but I think this is an okay summary. Um, so you know who the heck I am. Um, I have an official OHSU job, which maybe isn't that surprising. I practice in the emergency department. I do research on the topics that John Hunter mentioned. Um, I have a small role as a director of recruitment, equity, and inclusion. That's about two months old. Um, and my role is to try to improve the representation in our group. Um, and then, you know, just general university citizenship things, I would say, things like giving this lecture, doing a lot of mentorship, running a fellowship, um, serving on committees, things like that. Um, so that's like my official on paper job, what I'm here to do. If you look at the website, hopefully it reflects that. Um, but I have taken on a number of outside jobs as well. Um, I run a small company called Equity Quotient, uh, where we have developed and deploy metrics um, mostly to healthcare companies to try to help them have specific, concrete, quantitative and qualitative information that allows them to identify cultural problems within their workforce, um, particularly oriented around um, discrimination, racism, sexism, and other isms, um, and uh, allows them to follow these metrics over time so that when they implement organization level interventions, they have some idea of the impact is having on the ground with their employees and also can orient changes to the specific needs of employees on the ground. Um, and particularly with respect to things that are that are hard to convey from employees to leadership because um, they are difficult to talk about. They're often not even talked about at all. There are no forms to talk about them. And also because people fear retribution when they convey their feelings about those kind of um, uh, organization level cultural aspects. Um, so that's 
what equity quotient is. I, I'm also a writer and a speaker, um, mostly on issues of inequities. I serve as a medical analyst on, um, on national TV. Um, and that's kind of like a cluster of, I would call them jobs. I think I do them, I sometimes get paid for them. So I guess they are also jobs. Um, and then I have kind of an advocacy bucket that doesn't fall into either of those. Um, I, and largely that plays out visibly on social media. My uh, medium is Twitter. Um, I also serve on the boards of Times Up and Times Forward, which I mentioned, um, and then I have um, a kind of portfolio of pandemic work that is also focused around trying to write some of the very grave um, health inequities that have been playing out so uh, transparently during the epidemic. Um, so that's the kind of work I have, and I think I would say for that advocacy bucket, um, it it amplifies everything else that I do, um, and often is... Um, even though it's not really officially part of my job title, um, is such a major part of my identity um, and what I see as the urgent work that I do in this world, um, in this lifetime. So, yeah. And I think um, when, uh, you know, I think there's so many ways to do advocacy and uh, there's a certain way that I do that. I do find it very valuable to have kind of an inside um, advocacy work and outside advocacy work. And I mean inside one's own institution and then something that's outside. And I think inside allows you to get really granular about issues that you care about, um, develop hypotheses, have a trial and error period uh, period for um, for what it is that you think will work. Um, in academia, of course, we can have a very scholarly approach and have support with that. And I think it is also valuable to have a community of people you work with on a day-to-day -day basis around health equity. I also think, though, that it's very valuable to have an outside presence in your uh, in your advocacy work. Um, first of all, any ideas that you have, um, observations, uh, innovations, it is helpful to have a network um, and a platform where you can amplify those things across settings. I think it's very valuable to connect to others outside of your small bubble in your own workplace. Um, Sometimes change only happens when you make noise, and it is much easier to do that uh, with an outside platform. Um, I also think that external pressure on, on, on levers, um, and by levers, I mean just sort of the bodies, institutions, and people who are, are able to implement change. Sometimes a little external pressure goes a long way when kind of internal mechanisms don't work well. Um, and I also think, particularly as you go on your career, um, having uh, going beyond your institutional or local uh, spheres of influence and going on to have state and national, sometimes even international impact becomes more and more fulfilling. Um, so for me, and this is just for me, having kind of an inside presence and an outside presence in my advocacy work is tremendously helpful, um, logical, and fulfilling. You can go to the next slide. Um, so. Uh, how did I get to my area of advocacy? Because I, I, there are always questions about how did you figure out what you wanted to do? And I, I, I do think um, sometimes it is a calling, but I don't want to make it a magical process because then people feel really frustrated because then they're just kind of waiting for that strike uh, of lightning. So um, I will say there was some rationale to mine. It's just where I ended up and was kind of specific to me. And I think it will be to you as well. Um, so I, you know, I just started as a regular ER doctor and I honestly thought that's what I'd do for the rest of my life, maybe a little writing on the side. Um, but working in the ER, particularly um, at safety net hospitals, uh, health and equity becomes, it's just so front and center in what you do every single day. Um, every hour of every single shift. Um, and so I, you know, I, I became very oriented around these health inequities and, and how some of them are so tenacious and very hard, um, very hard to, to, to make change. And we make very little progress over time. And so really the, the ER we describe as kind of a revolving door um, for some of the, um, the outcomes related to health disparities and health inequities. Um, and, and at some point, for some reason, I became interested in what the healthcare workforce, the culture, the compensation, composition, who's in the room, just the dynamics of the healthcare workforce, how that fed into health inequities. And I will say, once I encountered that idea that these problems were, were so interconnected, I got stuck here for a long time. You can click for it. Um, and, and I just, I became so puzzled about, um, again, about what part of the problem um, diagnostically is resides within the organizations themselves. And I realized that if we can't get past that, we can have all the ideas about the changes we need to make. And we are unlikely to have much progress on an organizational level because we haven't fixed what's wrong with the organizations. If you click one more time, it'll um, I found it very hard to go back to fixing the health inequities unless we stopped and really thought about the healthcare workforce. You can go to the next slide. 
So, and, and I think there is this emerging literature that is um, so powerful and gets to the heart of the matter, um, which is that bringing in a more representative healthcare workforce has implications for hard downstream uh, key health outcomes. Um, this is a study uh, by a, a group of uh, researchers I really admire at the University of Minnesota, where they looked at um, newborn health outcomes and the impact of having uh, physician newborn racial concordance. Uh, and there actually was an improvement in mortality for black infants if their physician was also black. And you know, this is so different than the, the kind of con concordance studies we used to do where it was like, did you like the physician you had? Did you feel comfortable with the nurse that you had? We're not talking about preference uh, or fit. We're talking about actually hard endpoints that we care about that actually lead to, on a national basis, some of our most terrible and persistent health inequities. Uh, and this is just one of many articles that, that have been emerging that really look at the tie between having a more representative body of of, uh, of healthcare providers um, and what that means for um, for our for public health. Really, you can go to the next slide. Um, and um, I hope the slide is bigger for you than it is for me. But uh, when we look at the progress that we're making in terms of uh, diversifying our workforce, uh, it's it's a little discouraging. Um, so this is data from the AAMC. Uh, this is looking at just uh, female physicians, um, but but looking at the racial diversity. And you can see that the top line that you're seeing, the it's yellow to me, is the number of uh, the percentage of white physicians. Um, at the bottom, uh, sorry, the orange line is number of Asian uh, American physicians, and then every other race, racial or ethnic category is at the bottom. And you can see that looks pretty flat lined. And any gains that we have made in diversity is actually among Asian American physicians, not really in any other group um, in a way that feels meaningful over many years. Um, and why is that? You can flip forward. Uh, and, and part of it is that um, it's very hard. Uh, I think it's uh, one thing to get a diversity checkbox, but the other thing is to actually retain a diverse body of healthcare providers over time. And again, there are there is a whole body of literature that's emerged over the past decade that really shows what the experiences um, of physicians of a variety of backgrounds um, are when you come into medicine. And the truth is that we have not built a culture within our organizations that supports the kind of healthcare workforce that we say that we want. Um, so this is a study of surgeons um, uh, still in their residency training, responding to their experience of gender and racial discrimination. And you can see a racial discrimination um, column overall, 16% of residents said that they had experienced racial discrimination during their training. I um, mean, I would say that that percentage, it may sound low, but that's actually about the percentage of underrepresented minorities or my minoritized, I should say, residents in training at all. So it's pretty much everyone <laughs> who is, is vulnerable to experiencing the discrimination experiences it. you can go to the next slide. Um, and then this goes into uh, verbal, emotional, or physical health, and also sexual harassment, which was experienced more by women. So I think, you know, when you look at these, and, and you know, this is uh, one of, I, I could do a whole talk um, about experiences of harassment, abuse, um, and racialized abuses, but I, I can draw out a few big picture things just for, in the interest of time. You can go to the next slide. I would say when we talk about creating a workforce creating organizational change that actually allows us to fill our intent of being anti-racist organizations, um, anti-sexist organizations. Um, our, our organizations are characterized by these things. And I will say this just uh, speaking uh, very broadly across studies, across my work as a consultant looking at organizational change and building cultures um, that promote health equity and anti-racism. I would say our progress is very slow, glacially show, slow. It is actually hard to see positive change when you look over many decades um, uh, and of, of any sort of measurable indicators of change. Um, I would say also our, our work in this area is hampered by very little data and little evidence base. When you're doing clinical improvements, we tend to micro measure. We have so many process measures and outcome measures and sub outcome measures. Um, everything is chopped up into metrics. When it comes to things like building cultures that, um, that are truly anti-racist, that support uh, a, a much more representative workforce, 
there are very few metrics that we collect. Um, we don't agree on what the outcomes are, and so we don't develop clear targets. And so it's very hard to know whether an improvement has happened over ye from year to year. Um, and I've actually never been in an organization where I could just kind of rattle off the top 10 um, specific and meaningful and patient-oriented outcomes with relation to being, say, an anti-racist um, organization or an organization that is free from harassment. Um, the way that you can talk about the top 10 health indicators for women in any given year or our goals with regards to stroke care or to cardiac care. Um, and without specific targets, how do we expect to have anything but slow or really flatline progress? And I think that's part of the issue between how we have such fast institution of some of these practices that are, um, you know, that, that introduce structural racism into our organization and then such a slow dismantling of them. If you don't know where you're going, it's so hard to go in the right direction. And I think these are common themes almost no matter what topic you're talking about, our clinical practice, our hiring practices, um, you know, our day-to-day -day culture, the way that uh, organizational dynamics are on a departmental or division level, the allocation of leadership, all of these things, um, we have a very hard time talking about with great specificity about what organizations should do and how they should behave um, and what are the best practices that are supported by evidence. You can move forward. So what are our needs in this area if I had to come up with a wish list? And here are a few of them. Uh, um, one is I really think we need the laboratories of organizational change. If we say that we want to be anti-racist organizations, um, you can click to the next line. Well, let's invest in an evidence base of that uh, rather than just saying we've got a bunch of great ideas um, and, uh, and here's how we should implement them, but not really knowing which work best. Uh, next, you can go to the next line. Um, I think we need to be much more agile in making changes um, and not make solutions so much harder, um, act of Congress level uh, than, the, than the problems, than implementing the problems themselves. Uh, we need to make sure there's a very strong concrete link between stated intent and execution and click forward. Um, again, specify target outcomes with metrics attached to our target outcomes. Uh, routinizing conversation has come up throughout this whole series. Um, uh, and, um, and I think all of us recognize that we cannot fix what we don't talk about routinely um, and what we don't get comfortable talking about. So that's just a, a part of, uh, of this conversation, no matter how, how we slice it. Go to the next slide. Uh, sorry, the next click. Oh, it's the next slide, sorry. So just going back to how you kind of structure your spaces. Um, I mean, I sort of talked to you about how I have this sort of regular job, other side, well-developed hobbies, jobs, and also like an advocacy world. And I don't know that you need to, everybody needs to structure it like this. But I think the bigger picture is, uh, if you want to click forward, the way that I really think about it is just having a space where you are well-resourced, you can get the training and the skills that you need, um, recognizing that some of those places, um, especially during your training, will likely have parameters around your ideas and how quickly things can move. And so I think it's helpful just to consciously build out places where you can dream big and build solutions nimbly and without the constraints that some traditional organizations will have. And I think it's also um, so key to have places where you can find community on, on the health equity issues that you want to um, really invest your time and energy in and, and move the needle on, expand the reach of your, uh, have places where you can really expand the reach of your voice beyond the, you, you know, those who immediately surround you and start to advocate for big system-wide um, changes uh, on a much grander scale that you may be able to do to do in your kind of specified work sphere. Um, I think there are times where all these spaces are captured for people in their workplace um, or, uh, and, and things are much more streamlined, but it may be that if that's not true, um, you know, I, I think you don't need your, any one function or role to be everything for you in terms of your advocacy work. I think it's okay to sort of, you know, step out the door and build other spaces where you can be really functional in your advocacy work. You can go to the next slide. Um, I feel like people expect me to talk about social media and advocacy, so I did want to spend a little bit of time there. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Social media, of course, for me has been uh, a really big part of the advocacy I do. It allows me to uh, be really plain spoken uh, when I have observations of things that happen at work or, um, or when I really question um, the the um, our ability to make change and to really be the kind of institutions that we want to be. 
Um, and I think it's also, a, there's a big educational role for it um, for me as well, which is just, you know, do people realize how these issues play out? Their kind of, their underpinnings, what are the big things that we kind of need to do to change? And I think there are a lot of um, advantages to just having this forum where, you know, in really brief form, you can uh, engage with so many other people uh, and um, and ask some hard questions that, it can be really hard to say sitting around a table, but somehow are much easier to pose when you're talking to, you know, 150,000 other people. I don't know why that is, but it's it's definitely true. You can go on to the next slide. And for me, um, social media has really been a conduit to other opportunities. Um, so because of my social media presence and my interest in speaking about health inequities, um, I have the opportunity to uh, write a regular column for The Lancet focused on health inequities. Um, there's a lot of leeway there, so it's not always about that, but but usually um, it focused on some component of health inequity. And I will say when I was asked to do it, um, the ask was so funny because I was like, I don't know that I can write on demand every month. And the editor said, but you tweet all the time. So just take one of your tweets and put them down on paper and that can be the beginning of a column. And that's what made me feel like I could write one. So it really was a product of my social media account. Oh, the next slide. I think there's so many uh, advantages to social media, and I know there can be some hesitance to enter the fray um, and some concerns about the neg negative things that can happen there, the trolling and things like that. But I do think, particularly around health equity, it is an important space. Um, I think at any one institution or in any one a social circle, it can be really hard to find the community and support networks specifically around uh, health inequities. Um, there's so much real time and dynamic education uh, that happens there where I really feel like I'm stretched uh, in ways that I am not in more traditional environments. Um, it's a wonderful place to raise public awareness about issues that may be completely apparent to us in healthcare or may be apparent in the community and yet people um, writ large are not aware of them. So I think being able to share observations um, and, um, and knowledge to a very broad uh, public audience is so key in ultimately making change. Um, social media is also a place where there's a direct line to people who uh, are important levers of change and might otherwise be inaccessible. And that includes um, journalists, uh, people in media and policymakers. It's a great place to test out ideas and to generate ideas with your like-minded um, people uh, in, in your area of interest. And I also think it's it's an incredibly useful advocacy lever, just kind of referring back to what I said about sometimes a little external pressure can get a lot done. Uh, and if you're not in social media, sometimes you're not taking full advantage of how uh, kind of a public facing conversation can really put some some heat on organizations to make changes that they fully need to make, but might not do if it weren't in the public eye. So go to the next slide. The one thing I want to be key about is that, you know, people will say, oh, you're doing such a great job of advocacy on social media. And I think I don't really think of social media as my main advocacy work at all. Um, it kind of is the uh, the output, the out, the manifestation of the advocacy work that I do. And I think there has to be some on the ground work, some some meat behind the posts because they're just posts. Um, so I, I would just say, don't be too focused on the social media aspect. I think there are big advantages there um, and can really strengthen what you do and amplify it. But there has to be a core, a meat, a heart to it, the real content of your advocacy. Um, and that is, is largely under the surface and not on social media. Go to the next slide. So I know everybody wants to walk away with something to do uh, with regard to health equity and advocacy. And so, you know, here's a few things I would say. Uh, I'm sure many of you are far along your advocacy journal and uh, journey and could school me easily. But for those of you who are still kind of evolving into your advocacy role, I would just say today, this week, find something that you want to advocate for um, and just identify the specific measurable change you wish to happen. Uh, I think everybody knows how to complain about a problem. Um, attaching it to a specific change is much, much harder. Uh, so I would just uh, ask that you always try to link our int your intent to a concrete change. Um, I would like for all of us to think not just about individual, but organizational changes. Um, so I do think we tend to get a little stalled on what you should do. This is what you should do in that moment. And those things are good things and things that we should do. But I also think I, I, I would like much more conversation about how can organizations change so they can support individual actions that need to happen. 
Um, again, a kind of evergreen thing that we can all do is really try to routinize conversations about racism and health inequities um, with anybody, um, peers, patients, if you have a patient facing role, the public, anyone, and not wait for just health equity events like this to have those conversations, but just make them part of, you know, the wallpaper, the floor of your life. Uh, and then I do think it's it's much more likely that you'll have broad impact if you build out your networks and platforms little by little. It can be social media. I find that to be a good, accessible, and fairly easy way to do that. Um, but it can be through really uh, also through organizations, through your community, through different types of activities. Um, but I think it is it is worth it. And really, um, nothing can happen from individuals. It's really people banding together to make some of these um, long lasting changes. So. I think that, oh, sorry, um, as almost the end, I have one plug. Um, if you are interested in supporting um, a, a fund for our, our students, um, if you can go to this website, it's onwardohsu.org backslash students. Um, this is a, a fund to support uh, students from underrepresented communities um, and really would do, uh, has a high impact in, um, uh, in, in helping us build pathways into health careers. And I think if you go to the next one, it's just a thank you. We can move on to one more. <laughs> we can move on to, um, to questions. Well, Dr. Chu, th thank you so much for, for that. That uh, was, was spectacular. And, and, and we have um, some questions that have been sent uh, in ahead. Um, many of these questions, I think you've addressed in your talk, but I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to sort of, you say, amplify on and, and, and really help us sort of take these lessons home with us. Uh, and I think they're all, all five of the questions I have here are excellent. Um, at the end of these questions, I think there should be enough time to take some uh, additional questions. Um, the, the address that you should send those to, uh, if you have one for Dr. Chu, is events at ohsu.edu, and LENs will read those aloud uh, after we get through these first five. Um, so, so um, Esther, as the first question goes something like this. As a senior faculty member, I am frequently approached by junior faculty who, who are passionate about advocacy, but don't know how to get started. Other than providing suggestions for organizations they should contact, can you provide some general advice for how uh, such an individual should get started in advocacy work. Yeah, I think is, uh, I mean, I like the suggestion to connect to organizations or to other individuals who have been successful in advocacy. Um, and I think mentorship goes a long way here because uh, there are so many ways to advocate and on so many levels. Um, so I think um, identifying uh, someone who is advocating in the way that you want to advocate um, and seeking mentorship is a great start. Um, I do think just finding the people who are doing the work that you admire. Um, I, I do, I will say that when people are starting out, and this I would say is more trainees than junior faculty, but I would say the mistake people make is sort of feeling like they're just going to start something de novo, um, a, a brand new campaign or organization without spending a lot of time um, investigating what's out there. Because if you have an idea and it's a good one, and it's a very visible uh, area of need for advocacy, someone has noticed that before um, and is doing work. And I think it's much easier to support work that's existing. Um, so I, I think um, doing some outreach into people, I mean, Google is a very helpful tool, but doing outreach to people in your area um, I, I, that who are doing the work, even if it's a little bit tangential to the specific work you want to do, it gets you into the communities of people who have been really effective. And usually there's a whole structure set up there for kind of public advocacy on the ground, um, grassroots efforts, and also connection to policymakers um, and uh, and to the media so that, you know, the advocacy can be really full bodied. Um, but I would say starting out, I mean, I didn't I didn't do anything de novo for my entire career. I was just trying to help out. I think, you know, I think in healthcare too, sometimes there can be a room of like uh, 99 leaders and like really nobody wants to do the legwork. And I've spent a lot of time just being a really good legwork person. That's how you learn. Um, I think that actually that kind of hands on uh, experience is what ultimately puts you in a position to lead better. 
So I would say, you know, go in with some humility, look for what's already there, say yes to, you know, any way that you can help out, even if it seems kind of a little bit below your skill set and just get yourself to a place where you feel really confident and kind of um, can move on to bigger uh, roles and bigger types of advocacy. Well, th thank you for that. That <clears throat> The next question um, is, uh, how can individuals, especially OHSU members, make a difference? Uh, what should be on our list of actions to take, both specifically and generally? And I think perhaps you answer that with your last slide. Maybe just, just hit those high points again. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, those were, I always feel like what I choose for like what you can do today is a little bit, it's like a random selection out of 50 things I wish people would do. Um, so, I mean, certainly those things, I think just picking something, you know, and figuring out a concrete change you want to do. But I, I think too, there are, um, you know, I, I think sometimes there are uh, lapses in, you know, commission, you know, like things that we should be doing that we don't do. Um, but, the, you know, I, I think sometimes we also fail to remove ourselves from the equation. And I would say specifically in this time, um, I, I think some of the things that we really need to do uh, is, is step aside and create room for other people. Um, and that absence of doing something is, is really harder for a lot of people in healthcare. And, and what I mean is when we say that we want different leadership um, and we want different people to have a voice and a platform, it requires, to some extent, those of us who are used to having a voice and used to having leadership positions to defer them um, and to defer kudos, to def defer awards, to defer opportunities. We have to, on some level, to create space. And I think the not doing is so much harder for people than, the, than, than doing more. Um, it's kind of like Lent. You know, where people are like, I'm going to exercise more for Lent, but really what it is about is like removing something. Um, and so I guess like an ask that I, I rarely bring up is like, you know, really think about how we divert meaningful resources to, um, to, to uh, you know, those in our community who chronically don't have them. Um, and I mean, real resources, um, everything that is, um, is currency in your work setting, in, in our case, in the academic setting. Um, so funds, positions. Um, voice platforms. Uh, I think um, I think a good exercise for everybody is trying to figure out where am I occupying space and oxygen when I could deflect, you know, um, defer and actually create more opportunities for others. That's kind of a random one. I thought I'd add that to the list. No, I, I think that's great, and it, you know, the, the power sharing is such an important underpinning of moving to an anti-racist organization, and and so I really, really thanks for bringing that forward. Um, the next question is is um, really about social media. How do you stay motivated and optimistic about using social media as a platform for, for change when the misinformation and tendency for people to hear what they want to hear can seem overwhelming? Yeah, it really can, and it's real. Um, and and there um, and and sometimes, many times, you feel like you're just kind of preaching to the choir and you, in your bubble. And I, I do think that it's important uh, for that reason to diversify your your advocacy portfolio, you know. And and I think, um, you know, I think being steady and consistent, but not burning out, is so key. I mean, I have lots of built-in times where I just step away uh, because you need a little distance from that. Um, and then really think about not always messaging to the people who think exactly like you anyway, but trying to think like, what are the barriers to getting to a common understanding? Um, and kind of my, my move, everyone has a different move, but my move is like staying in conversations, you know? And so like, if you just stay and stay and stay, I feel like, um, there often is just a common root of people from all political persuasions. And I, I think my training ground has really been that I come from a family of very conservative people. I mean, probably as different from me politically as possible. Um, and, and keeping those relationships intact um, involves like being able to take a deep breath and just continue to chip away at why the conflict is there and try to find your way to some common Round. Um, and I swear to you, it is almost always there, even with people who believe, um, who spout very different things. Um, you know, I think we're, there is some shared humanity, believe it or not, even in this moment. Um, and then I think too, but I think the wellness piece is really important. So I think just stepping away, the heart feeds itself first. Um, you have to stay well so that you don't get burnt out um, and completely just, you know, lose your ability to be effective there at all. Thanks. These are great responses. I, I 
learning more and more. I, I think that this this fourth one actually sort of feeds into what you were just saying very nicely. Um, on Twitter, you have a tweet pinned about, um, I can't breathe. As a Latina, daily news makes me feel like I can't breathe every single day. What is your advice for building mental and physical resistance, relief, resilience to daily attacks uh, to non-white people? Yeah, I mean, I think I probably overuse the word exhausting, but what is what you know? What is the word ex except exhausting, depleting, um, demoralizing? Um, you know, and I, I will say, I think about this a lot as someone who is not black or Hispanic or indigenous and has a lot of privilege in my life. I think about it a lot because I think like taking oxygen from people is literal and it is figurative, um, and that that is what racism is. And I think, um, you know, I think there is like a quick you know a coping strategy and then i think there are just the kind of long-term fixes that we um, that we need to put in place um I, I think you know the coping strategies i think are just having building out a huge support network and when i am approached by students by trainees by junior faculty and they um, they're kind of really interested in engaging in anti-racist work or they're just experiencing so much racism and they kind of want to know how do they function. Um, and the first thing I say is, you know, what is your network? Who is on speed dial? Who is your community? Um, so that when these things happen, you have immediate validation and support. And I think we don't spend enough time building out those networks. It's um, actually a discrete task to build out a network of people who are trusted, peer mentors, supporters, um, who can talk you, you know, down off the wall when things are really, really feel terrible, um, because those are not moments where you feel like I, I have no breath. I, I am so depleted here. I'm exhausted by just being at that faculty meeting or being spoken to like that as I do my my day to day job. Um, moments like that are not, you know, it's not will they happen. It's when will they happen? How often will they happen? They're guaranteed to happen um, for people of color, um, particularly again, uh, Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, um, and others. And I think um, I think pretending like we'll just wait for it to happen, then we'll try to make up some stuff to support you. It's just I mean that's so naive. I mean what we should do is really anticipate that they're going to happen, and all of us, the community, should really be thinking about how do we support people better. I was asked that a lot this um, this season. I participated in, in residency interviews, and the incoming um, future residents had a lot of savvy questions, you know, ask me, I'm black, I see you don't have a, a lot of black residents, how are you going to guarantee that I will be supported when I experience racism uh, during my training? Uh, those are the kind of questions that we as a community need to be able to answer fluently, quickly after, the, you know, just like the, the, the tip of our tongue, we need to have those answers. And I think part of giving people back breath um, is, um, is, allowing people to have higher expectations of us, of the community that isn't experiencing those things. Because the truth is, when we don't have to experience those things, we have the bandwidth, we have the energy, you know, we have the oxygen to spare. So it really is a community responsibility um, to give you back that breath. Um, so I, I think uh, our role is um, increasingly raising the bar for what the community's obligation is to people who are chronically exposed to uh, to racism, to racialized abuses, um, and that is really on us, and that's the long term thing. And so, you know, for those wondering what to do, um, that is that is on us, and we need to think about that every single day and figure out how you work that in to um, everything that you're involved with. Another great piece of advice. Thank you. Um, the the fifth and last question that I have before we kind of open it up to questions that you may be sending in now. Um, it's, it's a little bit out of left field, but I think it's it's important to where we sit today, um, and it's about schools. So, what is your opinion about reopening schools, especially for disadvantaged students? Are the health risks worth it? I think the answer is solidly it depends. Um, I would say the key thing is that we don't. Uh, we allow the people who are most affected um, and most vulnerable to harms from it to speak um, and to drive the decision making in each community. Um, and I think there has been way too much of people who are not exposed to harms speaking on behalf of people who are bearing the burden of harms. 
um, and that needs to not happen. Um, and and there's a, a kind of long form discussion of this that I tweeted yesterday and I can bump up to the top um, if anybody's looking on social media or we can uh, pass around, but there's a, um, a local writer, Rochelle Chase, um, who is a leader in the Black Lives uh, Movement here, um, who wrote about um, how much in the discussion of schools, um, people are pinning decisions um, uh, on an argument that's based uh, on, you know, what we need to do for, for poor students, for students of color, for these communities, um, and yet the people speaking and dominating the conversation are not of those communities. Um, so I think this is a, there's a nuanced conversation. I think, um, I think every community is a little bit different, um, but I think we really need to make sure that we are bringing forward as leaders in that decision making, as the key agents in that decision making, the people who have the most to, the, the, um, who are vulnerable to the most harms. Um, and I also think that um, that that teachers have a, a big say, um, and um, uh, because they are older, uh, have more comorbidities. Um, and I think we we also um, have this conversation very parent driven and don't often bring in uh, the the safety concerns of of teachers and other school staff. That's a total non answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I think it's a great answer. Come on, that's wonderful. It's actually crazy, I, but it's like you know that that shouldn't be driving it. I just really would like them to be there. Well, Dr. Chu, I'm going to hand the virtual mic over to uh, Ellie Inns, who I see has now come on. Um, Ms. Inns, could you read the next question? Yes, of course. Thank you, Dr. Hunter, and thank you, Dr. Chu, for everything, um, for your time and all your insights. You've been wonderful. So we've had um, two other questions come in so far. So the first one I'll read to you is, what should white providers understand about culturally specific vaccine hesitancy and how should they support patients who are hesitant? Yeah, I think the first thing that, uh, and I will just sort of, I'm going to put myself in with white, I see myself as kind of, you know, it's like white and Asian um, are, are very um, aligned um, in terms of privilege in healthcare. And I would say what we need to do is fully explicitly recognize that hesitancy is born of both historical and current ongoing uh, racism in healthcare. And I think that doesn't need to be presumed, I think it needs to be explicitly stated and acknowledged in our conversations. There is a real reason for mistrust. It's not just like random mistrust, it's earned mistrust. And I think without that out there, it's very hard to have a conversation that doesn't, that isn't fundamentally flawed, <laughs> you know, um, because then it's just like, trust me, let me try to convince you. And, and there's no reason that we should be able to do that. Um, and, and the dynamic that we've set up during this pandemic um, is not it does not heal that um, that relationship. I mean, look at the boards of the manufacturers of the vaccine companies. Look at the lead investigators in the universities involved in the in vaccine studies. Um, there is nothing that will repair that trust in the timeline that we need to distribute vaccine. I think the other thing is to be extremely respectful about people's fears. I mean, they're not nothing. They're very real. They're super um, valid, and I think. Um, I think providing people with information, not loaded information, not like um, here's information that I can give you so that you make the right decision, but really being like the right decision is the one that you make. Let me just help by making information as accessible to you as possible, including not making you go hunt for it, having it in the right languages, um, having it accessible in every way, um, you know, um, uh, for for disability, for um, you know, for forms of delivery that are most uh, attractive and um, and easy to consume for you, really thinking creatively about how to do um, how to do uh, information delivery. Um, again, that is on us to just make sure that uh, knowledge gap is not part of the equation because we can help that. Um, I think also at this point, is there any better time in history to really amplify our black and brown healthcare providers who are actually doing wonderful messaging um, and education and connecting directly with patients who trust them and have more reason to trust them. Um, so I think, again, um, if there's one thing we can do, it's not me talking more, it's me finding, you know, as many uh, physicians who are, are black, indigenous, Hispanic, and trying to figure out how do I amplify you to the stars? Um, and that's actually a big chunk of what my behind the scenes work is these days, is trying to figure out how to use social media in a savvy way to try to amplify the voices that are much, much, much more important than mine right now. And then I think the last part of it too, um, and this is something else that I think should be 
a, a big upcoming campaign is if we get people to the point of uh, vaccine acceptance, um, are we removing all the concrete barriers that still stand between them and getting the vaccine into arm? So we can't just say, we're going to give you information, make the right decision, make the right decision, but we're not going to help you with paid time off, um, any financial losses for going and getting the vaccine, sometimes twice, um, extra days you need to take off because of vaccine side effects, transportation costs, childcare costs, um, knowing that who has the least financial reserve, who has um, the, who are more likely to be in, in frontline essential work uh, worker roles without, you know, without paid time off or financial reserve to be able to just, you know, just let go of, of that income so that you can go and get the vaccine. Um, you know, it's it's going to be disproportionately people of color and we'll just double down on the inequities by not trying to uh, erase some of these concrete barriers to actually connecting to vaccine. Um, so there's so much work along the whole continuum of con considering the vaccine and the getting all the way to actual receipt twice. And we have to be committed to toppling those barriers. Um, you know, in some cases, it can literally mean handing people money so that they're able to get the vaccine. I think all things are on the table, but certainly um, giving people vouchers for transportation, things like that should be no brainers. Thank you so much. I know that's so important right now. So I appreciate that. Um, it looks like we have um, just the amount of time for this last question. So this is perfect. Um, as a prospective student of the MD program, are there opportunities for students you see coming to fruition in the future that will allow us to start this advocacy and make changes early into our education? Yeah, thank you for that question. I feel like um, I feel like it's such a like a setup for things that I like to talk about. I think if there's one thing that we've learned during this pandemic, it's that um, healthcare uh, healthcare workers, public health professionals, uh, scientists can all be better in messaging. Um, what we found over the, the continuum of, of this pandemic was as we tried to advocate for things like, you know, the need for tests, the need for personal protective equipment, face mask wearing, we got it wrong innumerable times. And every message had unintended consequences. Um, I mean, one of those was early on when people said, when will we have a vaccine? Um, those of us who were communicating about science said, um, uh, do, you know, we didn't want to get people's hopes up that would be dashed and make people feel discouraged and, and hopeless. So we said, don't expect it too soon. There are a lot of hurdles. Let's think on a late 18 month to your timeline. And so when we said that, what happened? Um, it, people didn't expect it soon. So when it came sooner, when the vaccine happened within the year, it felt rushed. And, um, and it felt too soon because we had been telling people not to expect it too soon. And that was a harmful message. And I think we were, we were late to recognize that and more, we didn't communicate why we communicated that way. And I think there were so many mistakes like that made around messaging where it wasn't just that we, the message was wrong. That's part of it. But I think also explaining the thought process and why a message might change over time was not something that we were good at. And so um, for students, for trainees, I actually, my dream is that we actually start to systematically train every single health professional on best practices in health communication, um, on how you explain the scientific thought process and decision making right alongside the key health messages, how you come together in networks, multidisciplinary networks, and decide what the key messages are for an emergent disease that we don't know a lot about, um, but also for enduring diseases that we know a lot about, but the messaging needs to change over time. Things like, you know, general vaccines or climate change or, um, or other things. So um, opportunities for students, there are some, and I think we will probably develop them out over time. But I would say if you're a student coming in now, I actually think there's a big role for students and residents to lead in these efforts to ask you know, their health professional schools to give them content. Um, initially, I would say probably it will be um, more like elective content or one-on-one -on -one mentorship or maybe like elective time that you have where you build out your own. But I think ultimately there will be more and more component of health communication and advocacy um, built into curricula because it's such an important part of what we do and really, um, I think, an obligation for health professionals to know how to do some messaging and advocacy well. Thank you for asking that. Well, Dr. Chu, I think we are out of time. And in closing, uh, let me express all our gratitude uh, for your contributions to health equity in this country, for your contributions to our community and to OTSU, and for your time, your intellect, your energy, and your passion in sharing the last hour with us today. 
many thanks and have a wonderful day. Thank you for giving me this platform. It is our, it is our, our honor. Thank you. Great job. That was amazing. So wonderful. We're off. <laughs> We're off. Yes. A video. Okay, great.